as soon as it finishes saying that it's testing, then I'll um, actually talk to people instead of just talking about them. Oh, we don't count as people? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 not, <laughs> not <yet>. definitely not. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody out there. Um, nice to have you guys here. I'm here with uh, Tor and Mick. Mikko, um, you can only see Tor on video, but they're both here, so you should be able to hear them both. And say hello, Hi. guys. Hello, everyone. So these hello. are the guys um, behind Odin, the inspector for Unity, the awesome extension that most of you have probably heard of. And if you haven't, you'll know what it is by the end of this and probably want it and want to use it. Um, it's something that everybody that I know loves and generally recommends. So. If you're interested in extensions, um, learning about building extensions, learning about Odin and how it can make Unity better, or just about all of the stuff that goes into making cool editor extensions for Unity, um, this should be a lot of fun. And you know, let's get going, I guess. Do you want to start um, just by introducing Odin or talking a little bit about what it is you guys are doing at DevDog and uh, what's going on there? Um, sure. So. Odin is this, um, it's kind of like a meta tool. It's a tool for building tools. Uh, so often when you're working on a project in Unity, uh, the baseline Unity editor isn't quite cutting it or it's getting in the way. It's not quite customized to your specific use cases. And uh, the common approach without a tool like Odin is to go in and write your own custom editor or your own custom windows and so on. And it's a lot of work to maintain, especially since you want to be very agile and uh, and changing your game and iterating on it quickly. And then you suddenly have to maintain this whole separate set of you know, custom editor code uh, just for your game. And that's a huge burden. And Odin just gets rid of all that, makes it super easy, super slick and quick to customize your editors and make custom editor windows and just really customize your entire workflow um, without uh, that maintenance burden. And also without knowing so much about uh, custom editor coding at all, really. And then also on top of that, Odin comes bundled with a serializer uh, that lets you do a lot of things that Unity usually wouldn't let you do, like serialize and inspect dictionaries and delegates and a bunch of other things like that. Right, which I think is really important too. If you've ever tried to do a um, serialized field or a public field that's a, a list of something or a dictionary of something and got irritated because only arrays worked, um, Odin does just kind of make that easy so that you don't have to write the code for it and it just works right and you get a nice pretty inspector on top of it uh, so you get the ability to save out these dictionaries custom edit them and you know make them look pretty and not have to write a bunch of code for it and i think you'd mentioned a little bit about not having to write a lot of editor code but i mean the way that odin works like it's giving you a bunch of extra cool editor functionality and I think that for anybody who hasn't seen it in action, hasn't used it, it might be a little bit confusing. Like, how does it just magically know, um, like, did I want to show these things? And a lot of that's through attributes, but I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how, how you use Odin in your project. So you've, like, pulled in a, you've got a project that's partially going, maybe you've been working on it for a couple weeks, couple months, and you pull in Odin. How do you go about that process of hooking it up and starting to take advantage of, all of the functionality, or at least some of the, the low-hanging fruit, the easy stuff to start gaining value from? Well, even just by installing it, it injects itself all over for all of your like default baseline inspectors, right? You get nicer enum dropdowns right away. You get the better lists with drag and drop reordering and uh, paging and so on. So just out of the box, without you doing anything but installing Odin, you already get quite a lot. Um, uh, I mean, there's also like, we, there's lots tons of little augmentations to the custom inspector that we do. And then um, we just add on top of the, you know, a lot of people know the, the normal attributes that you can put on stuff in, uh, in Unity, like range or header that do like tiny uh, things in the editor. And we just add like another 80 or maybe 90 by now of those that you can do all sorts of- We have a hundred by now. Don't we have a hundred? We have a hundred, okay. Probably. <laughs> we keep adding new, I don't know, I don't have track of how many of them we have. We have a ton of them. So just out of the box, you can just put these little tags on members in your code, and then you get a hugely customizable, powerful inspector out of that. It's really, really modular. Like the attributes can often work together and be composed. You can group things and combine groups and so on. So it's pretty, um, it's really pretty powerful out of the box, just what you get with attributes. 
it takes a lot of the heavy work out of making custom inspectors, custom editors, custom UI from your uh, editor code and just lets you focus on the actual logic you need. Right, so you can just focus on the gameplay code and actually building the game, not have to do so much custom editor work. I mean, I really love the uh, the value there, just because you get, I, I guess you, I, I it's like well, exactly what you said. You get to work on your game and not have to do all of this reflection and um, custom editor. I, I, for anybody who hasn't done a lot of custom editor work, it usually starts off very simple, right? It starts off easy. You make an editor for this attribute, and it does one little thing, and it's nice and simple. And then it gets dramatically more complicated the second you want to do anything beyond just showing a simple property, right? It's because the the system's not super easy to work with and use, and it's a whole other mindset of stuff that you've got to hook into and tie into and a whole bunch of systems that you have to tie into. So it's extremely time-consuming, extremely slow. And I think just like you guys have mentioned, the way that it auto-hooks up and the way that you use attributes to accomplish most of the work and most of the common things makes that extremely easy and simple and just quite a bit faster. I almost feel like we should talk about some examples or um, show an example of this. Is, is there a good attribute example you can think of that um, really like highlights some of Odin's power? Well, um, there is, of course, uh, stuff like uh, the show if or hide if and enable if, disable if set of attributes uh, that are like they, they encompass this really common operation that a lot of people want to do where, where they want to conditionally hide or show some part of the inspector. And um, with the show if or hide if, you can just very, very easily do that. You can even write just an expression in the actual uh, attribute uh, argument as a string. And you can just specify like, show this uh, thing if that bill is toggled or show this thing if that value is over five or, or over five and under 10 or something like that. Yeah, I thought that one was really cool. And that's showing it in the inspector, right? So it's like if you have, and you have um, an RPG example that shows some of this stuff all hooked up, but you've got a consumable item that has a duration only if it's a consumable item, right? And that field only shows up if, if the item type is the correct item type or if it, if it had a duration, I forget which one it was. Um, Let me just pull but, up that one actually. Yeah, I, I have that code up in a window, so. Yeah, only if uh, consume yeah. over time is checked, then it shows the duration of it, right? So you check consume over time, and then the duration window shows up. So it's that custom inspector stuff that normally you would go in and go like, okay, let's make an inspector. We'll show this only if this value is greater. Now you can just add a little attribute that says, hey, if this checkbox is checked, which is literally just checking a bool. I was amazed at how simple it is just checking a bool, but like you said earlier, I think you could do any kind of expression in there and then just make things show up. Um, and then somebody had mentioned in chat too, the button attribute, which I thought was really cool. Yes, and, um, the button. You talk about that really briefly. Everybody, everybody loves a button. Uh, it's a lot of times you have like, you just want to execute a method or do some piece, like uh, have some way of invoking a particular uh, functionality and you can just put button on any method in your script and we'll make a button that calls the method for you and it's that simple and there's nothing more to it of course and you can even uh, have methods with arguments or that return values and you can set them well we'll have a part of the inspector that has the arguments and you can just add in some arguments and then you can click the button and it shows you what the result type was you can expand expect that inspect that so um are you getting it's a really feedback? Um, for me? Yeah, it sounds like it. There's a little bit of a hum. It, it went oh, away. Oh, just my, my phone that like just yeah. rang as well. Oh, so okay. <laughs> uh, so go ahead. My You're... Favorite oh, go ahead. Uh, I think um, my favorite attribute is the required attribute. Uh, oh, yeah, I love that. On any, uh, on any reference field, and if it's say, a prefab reference or a scriptable object reference, and if that thing's null, it'll show up as an error. Oh. And uh, and with the validator, you can actually scan your entire project and find all of these errors. Um, and we have other errors than just the required one. And you can just find them all at once quite easily. Oh, wow. That's one I didn't yeah, know that's about. The, that's, the, um, that's actually a paid add-on for Odin. It's like an extra little thing you can purchase on our, our little and little. It's, it's pretty huge, actually, um, in terms of value uh, that yeah. you can buy on our website. Uh, as an extra add-on 
and no, uh, that will cool. yeah that uh, you can with Odin it lets you easily specify rules like require it or show this error or you, there's a, also an attribute called validate input that's like the generic version it's kind of like show if where you can just provide any expression that evaluates to a boolean value and then that's the rule and if it's false well then th that's an error uh, and the project validator will go through and scan your project and can find like thousands of things in, in a second and then you can check it out all check it all out inline and go fix it right there so yeah. that, that one's pretty useful i can think of a, a lot of good uses for that and i mean i've got a big project that uh, i had mentioned earlier you guys 100 gig project and it's got a ton of prefabs and objects and assets and references get broken all the time so it'd be actually really helpful to just be able to run the tool and find all of the broken references because a lot of the time when there is a bug it happens that somebody accidentally broke a prefab reference in something didn't realize it and um there's no call out right there's no way to know that you broke a prefab reference other than things break at runtime there's there's usually yeah, exactly. nothing to check it so that actually seems really really helpful um uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna the try validator. That one the validator can even um, like you can automate the scans such that you can create these global rules that say when the when somebody enters play mode, scan the open scene, and if there's any error in the scene, stop them from entering play mode and pop out the validator with the errors. Uh, oh wow. And stuff like that. Yeah, and it can even do that. You can also stop you from entering from making a build, and you, and you can consider you know you can say if there's a warning, well, there's also you can have errors, warnings, and you know messages. And if it can, you can say if there's a warning, I'll consider that like an error, and uh, you have to stop the build if there's a warning, uh, or if there's an error. Yeah, that seems. Yeah, uh, that's going to be my new uh, my experiment for this week, seeing how how well I can integrate that in and how many problems I find. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not too many. But I guess I need to go in and add that required attribute. But uh, I'm kind of excited about that. It seems like it's going to solve a big problem that I've kind of fought with and ignored because I didn't have a good solution. And uh, it's interesting to stumble upon a good solution in, in a live stream. That's great. We have an anecdotal story, actually, a company that um, is building an MMO and they uh, they implemented the validator and then they, they tracked down, they added some custom validation rules. It's very extendable and they tracked down, I believe they said like 9,000 errors somewhere in that vicinity in one day. It oh, wow. All of them right away. That's and then with huge. some extra scripting, they managed to fix all of them as well as by the call code. Yeah, they automated the fixing okay. as well and made that part of the validation. So if it detects the error, it just fixes it right away. That sounds great. Makes a lot of sense too. If you're going to automate it, you may as well automate it as much as possible. Mm, yeah. Sweet. Well, um, there was something else. Oh, I wanted to bring up really briefly before I forget and get distracted. I, I did want to go into people's questions. By the way, if you guys had questions, there was a form in the description. Feel free to just submit them and we'll dive into them too. And we can look at questions in chat. It doesn't look like there are too many. Sometimes it gets overflowing and overwhelming. Um, but about the static inspector. So I, I think it's an extremely useful thing because I constantly have static things where I want to go look at the value and then I find myself having to attach at a breakpoint and then go look at the thing or write something else to, to write the value out. So I thought that that was a really neat and useful tool. Um, do you guys find people use it for a lot of different things or is it mostly just debugging like I, I use it for? Or why, or what, what led you guys to build it, I guess? I'm kind of curious. Well, sometimes you people were asking to be able to inspect static things, or at least just put like uh, the we Odin has a show and inspector attribute, and they wanted to be able to put that onto things to show them in the inspector, even if they weren't serialized, just to see what, what was in them. And the static inspector was kind of a natural extension of that. As soon as we had the ability to inspect static things, then it was just a tiny little extra jump to add a window where you could select any type and just view it statically. Um, so we did that because it seemed like it would be super useful. Yeah. Well, it's been helpful for me. So, <laughs> and I expect it to continue to be helpful. I don't know. I might be weird though. I might be the only one that overuses I, it's, statics. <laughs> it, it, it depends. I, I mean, how useful it is for you it depends on, on how you make your game. Like you say, do you use a lot of static stuff or not? Uh, it's, yeah. It can also be useful, especially with the, it's a recent thing in Odin with the, where we show the result type or the result of the method you invoke, that it's not just you can, you know, 
you can go in and, and look at data, but you can also go in and just say, I wonder what this method returns if I pass this to it. Uh, you can just go click the button for that method. You can sit and give it arguments and look at what it returned. Uh, so that's also quite useful. But it's also dangerous, the static inspector, right? Because we don't do any safety checking. You can just go into yeah. some internal Unity type and invoke some static method with the crazy argument or a null pointer, and then the engine just crashes Crash instantly. Unity, yeah. Like, yeah, it's very easy to crash Unity. You can access yeah. practically anything in that in the static inspector. So nice, unlimited power, right? <laughs> mm. That's cool, though. I, like I said, I think it's super useful. Um, and there was a chat uh, question in the chat about is Odin easy to get into? I was kind of curious. I think that it is. I think that there's a lot to it. There's a lot to understand to get the full power, but I think that you can kind of get started with it almost right away with no upfront really time cost or anything else, right? What do you guys think about that? What's that onboarding process be like to you guys? As Tor mentioned earlier, as he probably wasn't here, but just, just installing earlier, uh, just installing Odin, you already get better inspectors by default, better lists, better uh, enum dropdowns, and better ton of things. And then the rest of it, is pretty much all through attributes. Um, it and it, it kind of depends, right? How well do you know the idea? Some people just jump right yeah. into it and they're like, oh, I get this. That, that's how this works. And they just instantly, intuitively almost predict how everything works because it's kind of logical when you know the basic ideas, right? But other people don't know what an attribute is or don't know how things work. And then it can be a little bit harder. The better, it. Uh, the better programmer you are, the easier it will be. But even as a very um, inexperienced programmer, uh, it, it's pretty easy to get into with a little bit of reading. Oh, OK. Yeah, I would say if you've built um, some custom inspectors, for sure, like it, it's, easy, it's probably going to be a little bit easier to get into. But I think that the way that you, if you've just used attributes alone, um, the way that you pop up the nice attribute inspector and the examples right at the beginning makes it pretty approachable to just start getting value out of it, right? Because you can just sit there and spend an hour or two going through all of the examples and finding things you're like, oh, that's cool. I can just add that on. Oh, I can just add that on. And you're literally just adding a square bracket, a word, and, a, and an ending bracket, right? Like you're getting this yeah. extra stuff in there. Um, that's that, that's true. That's That makes it very, very easy. It's It's been... Um, it's certainly been made a lot easier uh, than it was. We didn't have an attribute overview always. That's a new thing. And we didn't always do all the nice online examples that as well. We've been steadily improving the documentation. I think anybody buying out in now will have a much better and easier experience than somebody who bought it like two years ago. Yeah. Uh, that's one question in chat I just want to address. The This uh, may break your project if you use it messages. Those are all about the uh, the Odin serializer. If you just use the inspector, those are not relevant to you. And also, it's a it's a matter of um, saying this may break your project. A slight hyperbole, really. Uh, but we want to be upfront and honest about uh, the fact that it, it it does introduce a really core, huge dependency on this big system. A system that thousands and thousands of people are using, granted other assets are using it, and the serializer is extremely well proven by now, but it is a huge dependency. Uh, I mean, I would personally rather trust my <laughs> serializer, like the Odin serializer by now than Unity's own, especially with all the recent Unity patches, and it's gotten pretty unstable, uh, but... Uh, but still, we want to make sure that people know what they're getting into, because removing the serializer once you've got it, it's really, really, really difficult because it contains all of your data. And if you remove it, then all of that data is gone. Uh, and that's not very nice. You have code, code dependencies on it everywhere. So then if you, so say you do implement the serializer, right? And um, you custom serialize one little bit of stuff, right? You got this one thing, you implement the serializer because you've got this one spot where you're doing a dictionary. And um, some reason you decide you can't use Odin, you know, whatever pointy haired boss says, no Odin, it's got to go. Um, you pull it out. You, you only lose that dictionary serialization and everything else is still around and it's easy to revert that. Or do you have to yeah. go through a process? Then yeah. you, you would only lose that dictionary serialization. Okay. 
you can set up logic that can convert from the dictionary to a new format that Unity can then serialize. So you're not totally screwed, but that's definitely a work that you need to uh, keep in mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that people would generally need to switch away. I think that if you get into Odin and you, um, you know, do like a week long experiment and everything seems good and you're good with it, you're probably not very likely to switch away from it. And, and to even have that issue. But I just want to make sure that people, uh, if you do, it's only that tiny little bit of extra value that you were getting that you're going to lose from pulling it out. You're not ruining your whole project. So I think the, the warning message um, and the idea, like people could get concerned that, hey, if I do this, like I could be you know, causing a giant pain, but you're really not. You're just, it's that little tiny bit of extra stuff that you were getting that you might lose if you had to undo it. But like I said, I, I, don't, I can't see many scenarios where that would be the case. No, it's mostly fine. Um, we haven't actually had any complaints, really. I, I think maybe we've only had, throughout all the years, one or two cases where people had to remove Odin because the serializer was causing issues. And we fixed the issues in those cases, but they'd already done it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, generally, the warning is just to, to be honest and, and upfront. And maybe it's not very marketing friendly, but we'd much rather be, uh, be frank and, and blunt uh, about what the customer is getting into uh, rather than try to make them use something that might not be right for them. Right. Because uh, if you just, uh, in the example that you mentioned before we uh, started the stream uh, with the Yulong backed enum, like adding the whole of Odin Serializer just to get a single Yulong backed enum, that's maybe not the best idea, right? I mean, it's a pretty big dependency yeah. for. Pretty tiny thing, and it's that kind of stuff that I mean, you need to you need to have a real need before you ought to use it. But then, if you do have a real need, I would suggest you do use it, except with prefabs. That is the big, yeah. big, big caveat of Odin Serializer, uh, and I would even say normal Unity stuff by now. If you do prefabs and nest the prefabs, if you have anything that's complicated in them, anything at all, even without Odin, just don't don't do that. But we've not been able to have proper support for Odin serialized nested prefabs. It's just the system is not stable enough. So that is officially a deprecated feature. We do warn people when they try to use it. Um, oh, okay. There's a really big, really nasty warning that, that's like flashes red on your screen and says, this is broken. Do not use this. Your computer may turn into a flaming wheel of cheese. Uh, so yeah, that, that is the one copy. Yet. Okay. And that's ju just with nested prefabs, not with variants. Uh, variants are nested prefabs. Uh, it's it's almost the same. It's, it's oh, the really? same fundamental logic that 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 is the, the backs the two. Yeah. Oh. Okay. It's it's a it's a val it's a set of value modifications. It's a a variant has like can have var variants can have variants can have variants right. So it's like right. this nested layer of value inheritance and mm -hmm. nested prefabs are the same. Like you can look at a prefab within a prefab as a kind of variant that is that inherits value changes from that other prefab. It's it's very slightly different, but basically the, okay. the core tech behind it is the same. And the, kind of the like a one use it, variant. It's the same. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Interesting. So um if you don't mind, I was just kind of curious, what were or what do you think was like the hardest part of dealing with serialization in unity what was is it prefab serialization that's the most difficult thing to to work out and get everything fancy in odin or is there something else that's even more complicated and like struggled harder with it's prefabs prefabs like <laughs> far and away uh, there's i have absolutely no doubt in my mind most people don't know what prefabs are or the insane craziness that happens like uh, prefabs behind the scenes in Unity to make yes. prefabs work and to make them pretend to be normal things when they're not. They're these alien eldritch abominations masquerading as normal components, but really they're not at all normal components. They, they're a, a, like a base set of data and a set of modifications on top of that. And that sounds simple, but all of the crazy implications of that are like, wild and insane. And Unity's API for working with prefabs is not very reliable at all. Um, it's very inconsistent in what happens when you call things and when you get the callbacks. So 
uh, even before the, the 2018th of three, when Unity introduced a new nested prefab stuff, prefabs was like, um, if there was oh, yes. any bug in Odin certification, it was 90% of the time it was prefab related. Yeah. Always. Uh, it does work very reliably in 2018.2 and, and like lower versions than that. Uh, we got it to a pretty, pretty good, pretty damn good point. But with the nested prefabs, Unity rewrote the prefab system and just broke everything completely. And we can't work with it anymore. It's impossible. Yeah. Oh, really? Is it harder and, uh, to work yeah. with now? Yeah. It is. Uh, it's, it's harder if harder is like infinite in that it's not. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mean it's difficult to do nested prefab certification support. I mean, I spend month in and month out, and I have no idea how many hours and sleepless nights trying to make it work with the new nested prefab system. And it is not yeah. possible. Or at least if it is, then I, I don't know how to do it. I tried at least a dozen different fully coded custom implementations that tried to make it work, each uh, increasingly insane and desperate. And none of none of it none of it was good or worked or was anything I wanted to publish or ever make people use. And huh. the insight I got into the Nestor prefab system from that process makes me just not want to ever use them at all, whether Odin is involved or not. I'll be honest. Huh. I don't trust them. That's I mean, interesting because there was a question. Use about the prefab system use them with Odin Serializer. There was a question about that in the chat as well. Um, I uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, that was, go ahead. Oh, because uh, I just saw a stream, like, do you, uh, uh, a question here. Do you recommend against using master prefabs altogether? No, I don't recommend against using them altogether. Um, there's things that they're good at, and there's things that they're bad at. They're bad at containing data uh, in the sense that they're bad at having, if you have a list that has the structs in it, that has lists in it, and now you use the new Unity's new serialized reference for polymorphic data. And you know, the more complicated your data is, the more there is of it, the more likely something will go wrong. You'll start losing references. Uh, randomly, stuff will just vanish or change or reset. And it's just um, it's very unreliable for that. But there are cases where it's great. And, and if, as long as you only have simple data, a few strings, a few bulls, a color here, a material there, you know, it's great for UI. Have a have a prefab uh, like composable UI where each little element is a prefab and you can change all of the buttons and all of your various pieces at once. That's great. It's awesome for that. It's great for graphics. It's great for composing game objects and components together in nice ways. Yeah. That that is its great strength. And I would absolutely recommend you use it for that. I would use it for that. I do use it for that. But I would not try to do weird complicated data inheritance structures with it because that's just asking for trouble i can see that yeah i use it for it ui stuff data, basically. Yeah. yeah yeah and it's great for that it's great for ui stuff it's absolutely amazing yeah. for your stuff it's a godsend for ui stuff yeah it really helps there um i i, I may come across as overly critical uh, of it i it's not that i hate it it's just that i think it's really bad at this one specific thing that people keep trying to do with it and that I spend a long, painful time trying to support, but uh, it's not—it's not good for that. It's good for other things. It's it certainly it's got its good points. The prefab system actually kind of scares me, for the most part. Like you can you can really just change one variable somewhere that you're not supposed to change, and now it's changed everywhere suddenly. Um, it's about the kinda, feature and. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a dangerous yeah. feature, but it's, it's, that's also what's useful about it. Yeah. But Do you find it, people use it? Oh, go ahead. But sometimes it has this uh, apply thing at the top, right? So if you have it in a scene and you change one variable somewhere, which is just specific for this case, and someone else comes in and says, oh, there's some changes, uh, just apply everything. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. That's like anything up, yeah. that's a big sharp tool, use it with care, right? But that's yeah. the case with anything. If uh, you can't put safety stuff on everything, then nobody could ever get anything done. It's true. It's balancing act. Yeah, it's like what Jonathan Blow says about like safety features and programming languages and abstract and like stuff that doesn't allow you to do things for safety reasons. Uh, 
that doesn't allow you all the, uh, he would rather just give people all the sharp tools they need that let them mess things up. And then the answer is don't hire bad programmers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is it's not a pretty programmer simple, really. using this, right? This is a game designer or a level. Yeah, it's true. Designer. It's yeah. true. It's true. It's a good we point. can't expect much of those people. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I think you got to make it as easy as possible, right? E even for other programmers, the goal is make it yeah. so that the code base and the project is as easy as possible to use. But I mean, Just, especially when you're working with designers and artists and stuff who aren't normal, this isn't like their day to day where they're in the editor doing this stuff. They're writing docs and drawing art and crap. So yeah. it's like when like, I jump into my, it, it, it should speak for itself, what you're not supposed to do, uh, which is actually one of the things Odin really helped with. So you know, that's the thing. Yeah, that's true. It makes it much easier if the designer has to set up a thing. Well, then the programmer can easily just decide, well, this thing is required and this thing has to be within these ranges and this thing needs to be linked up to that thing in that case. And if you don't toggle this pool, then the whole part of the inspector that it uh, works with is disabled because you can't do anything with it anyways. And, you know, all kinds of little useful things like that. Makes yeah, I, I think that RPG example really um, kind of highlights that too because it shows um, the difference between a good inspector and editor and yeah, well i guess it doesn't necessarily show an old one but i think anybody can picture the the default version of i made a bunch of text fields and you have to go guess what goes in them and guess the ranges and stuff like um i feel like i should just pull up the uh the rpg i'm gonna screen share real quick let me switch i'm gonna put us on desktop mode we should still be able to see us floating All over right. it but I want to just kind of let everybody see what it looks like when you're. So this is um, the Odin well, RPG. At the stream for that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So this is Fine. the Odin RPG editor window. This is just a custom window you guys made as an example, and then go in and modify characters, armor, go select all of the things. You can also go in and just select them. So you've got like these custom inspectors down here. If I go select a character. I can see the character over here with the inventory. I assume everybody on the stream can, can see this and get a, a good idea of what's going on. Let me just drag this over to the right side. I have way too much stuff on my screen at a time. Okay. So you can see like you get this nice little uh, inventory editor window, starting stats, starting equipment. You can see just how beautiful and easy it is to use. And if you compare this to a normal editor window where you're putting in numbers on these stats and like putting in an item ID or grabbing a serialized field. You can actually disable her. Odin and see how it looks without Odin. Oh, how do I disable for Odin? Where's uh, the tools, talk preferences for that? Odin inspector preferences. Oh, and I, I, then under editor types, there's enable Odin. Uh, you can just do oh. global toggle. You can just I don't know if that will work in an editor window, doesn't it? I don't know if it works in the window, but it will work in the inspector. It worked for this one, though. You can see my starting equipment just became this. My uh, yeah. Hey, you can see you can see the the big difference. Go select an item versus I turn on the inspector. Did I just turn it back? Oh, oops, that one. There, turn it on, and suddenly I've got this. Nice, easy to use inspector, turn it off, and suddenly it's, I, I'd say, quite a bit harder. And just the, the time savings that you get there from having designers be able to tell what to do, where to change things, how to adjust stuff is going to be huge. Um, or be able to go in and add a modifier and just pick from the list instead of having to go through the, the older process. In fact, let's see, what does that process look like? If we do it the other way, it's expand, 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 change that to a three, expand out this element. Um, oh, I can't even, like, you get the idea, like, it's a lot easier, I think, with, with Odin for designers, so, I would recommend it, <laughs> if you're, if you're building this kind of stuff, especially, where you have this kind of data, and you can put together these inspectors, um, oh, there was a super chat in here, too, would either of you guys consider using Unity to create a software application that's not a game, but a software app, like an office program? Probably not. I, I think um, there's better tools for that than, than Unity. Well, it'd have to be a kind of unusual Office application at the very least, right? Uh, yeah. I guess there are cases where you can make arguments for it. And Unity like if, does if like run on your toaster uh, practically. Yeah. I mean, what doesn't Unity build to these days? 
So there is that. You there's some, some kind of 3D but... graphics or something. Then yes, Unity would be a decent choice, a pretty good choice yeah. even. Yeah. Unity isn't made for it though. Maybe with the UI elements, right? Because that has the 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 kind of typical lazy uh, UI update um, um, workflow and, and and like runtime behavior where you're not doing like full rendering every frame and you're not eating like oodles of battery. Maybe. Maybe that your elements for runtime might change that equation. I don't know. That might for some stuff. Yeah. I, I, my general rule is that if it requires really advanced visualization or needs to be um, multi, like cross platform on a bunch of stuff, then I will at the very least consider Unity. So if it needs, like, if it could do well with good 3D models or particle effects and visual effects, or obviously if it's like augmented reality stuff. Um, but yeah, for like absolutely. general things, it's like if it can take advantage of one of those things that Unity just beats everything else at, then yes, otherwise um, look at some of the alternatives. A lot of the time it's, it goes between like being a web app and a Unity app for me now. Um, very rare that I'll go with like an, an actual like a Windows app anymore just because you, know, you, you really only need them in enterprise environments most of the time now. I I agree with you completely there. But I have used Unity and I've seen Unity used for a lot of non-game apps. They just always tend to be apps that can use some visualization, modeling things in the real world, um, modeling physics um, or visualization of data are, are really mm -hmm. big scenarios for that. That and interactivity. Uh, people that want to do yeah. things where it's like multi-touch and they want to drag and move things around um, a lot easier to do in Unity than in any other environment. I mean, if you, if you want to do something fast and you have a lot of experience with Unity, then it's also a good choice already. That's true. Uh, I did actually work at this one place where I worked uh, work for hire, um, where one of my co-workers actually made a, an editor out of Unity and just made a edits a game and gave it to another company so they could edit the data with that and set it up in that way which worked pretty well yeah i could see it working i mean if you're good with unity and the project is simple enough there's no reason not to just do it if you if you don't have another alternative that you're good with like i wouldn't go try to pick up web development to build a simple app that i could also build in unity um if i didn't already know how to do web development that is <laughs> All right. Well, um, let me see what other questions we had because there there was a couple in the form that were pre-submitted and we haven't dove into those yet. So let's see. Um, oh, actually, this was one that we had talked about a little bit before, and I, I think um, it's been asked in chat a couple times, which was about redistributing Odin, and um, they want to be able to redistribute. Or they want to be able. A lot of people want to be able to build an asset, but they want to use Odin in their asset and they want to be able to sell their asset on the asset store, um, which obviously requires people to yeah. have Odin. Do you want to just talk briefly about this? Because I know you get this question a lot. Yes. Oh, yeah. All the time, basically. You want to fill uh, it, Michael, or should I? Uh, yeah, OK. The answer, it's quite simple. Uh, the answer is basically no, don't. Unless, unless you list uh, Odin as a dependency to your asset, uh, but right now, there's no including with it. It's something we have been looking into, but it's just difficult to do. And it's uh, not difficult for technical reasons. Well, also for technical reasons, but those can be fixed, right? Yeah, but also for licensing reasons and whatnot. Exactly. Yeah. So it it's, it's more the licensing, yeah. Uh, for example, if, if Odin costs like $55, uh, I think it is right now then it can somebody redistribute Odin and sell it for 20. Does all of Odin then work there or does it just work for their editors? And how do we make that lockdown then? And, uh, or, or would it be like some sort of revenue share cut? How much would such a license cost uh, for infinite redistributors? Well, it's just, there's just so many questions and there's so many different cases where it's a big company that wants to do it, or it's the small guy who's making a neat tool and he wants to use Odin for it, can't pay like $10,000 for distributable or whatever. And it's it's really, really difficult. And we have not found any correct answers yet. That makes sense to me. I think it's a difficult one too. Like I said, mostly for the 
the legal and licensing stuff. Um, the technical stuff seems a little complicated too, but I think overall, yeah, it's it's hard. It sucks, but I mean, what are you gonna do? Yeah, just Unity's got to buy Odin first. <laughs> that would yeah. solve it. Then Odin could be free, and everybody yeah. could depend on it as much as they want. Yeah, and nice and simple. Uh, so easy solution. Just get Unity to buy them. Oh, and then um, I wanted to jump onto that documentation question. So there was a question about how you create documentation for your projects and methods. And you guys have such good documentation and interactive um, example stuff. I thought it'd be interesting to talk just briefly about how you guys do that, what your system is to, to make all that work. Um, you gonna dive into that? We have a big button. We just smash our face into and then it updates everything. <laughs> and it's just all automated, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it used to be manual, but these days it's automated. We use doc effects. Uh, for generating the the base set of documentation for all of the classes, um, and our web we, we use a custom set of templates that spits it all out into a data format that our custom coded website made it written in ASP.NET then knows how to um, parse and understand and it can then present the documentation nicely. And then um, for the attribute overviews, uh, we have the attribute overview that you highlighted. Um, in um, uh, in the editor itself, like within Odin. And it's the exact same thing. If we just parse that as part of our build process and we just pull out the attributes, use reflection, you know, we go in, we find the source code and um, we just take some screenshots and automate everything and upload it onto the website. So it's all kept up to date without us having to do anything but click a big red button. Sounds really nice. How long did that take to set up? Is that a long process or like a couple weeks uh, or a couple months or over years of changing? It's a good question because it, it's multiple systems that sort of come along the way and then eventually been put together. Uh, we've had the ability to take screenshots of code for quite a while. Uh, that's actually one of our testing tools that just takes screenshots of everything we have and then compares them against each other. Um, and that way we can quickly see if we accidentally uh, fuck something up before we publish. Every it. label is shifted to, towards the right by one pixel, yeah. then it'll catch that and say, hey, what did that happen? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I All think right. there was once hide and inspector suddenly didn't work. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and, the blue asset, and the asset list attribute relies a lot on that, actually. So suddenly there was a bunch of extra fields where they shouldn't be. Um, so we made that to fix that. Huh. And and then we have a, a command system where we can chain things together and make some common functionality really easily. And eventually, everything just got put together into one big thing, one big button. And that's, that's literally what it is. It's just one big button, and it does. It makes builds. It makes five different builds we have on the website to download right now. We have. It updates the documentation. It up updates the uh, attribute uh, examples on the website. Um, and it's actually super cool. Yeah, it sounds nice. It's always good to automate, I think, as much as possible. And it sounds like you guys have automated a lot. Just really cool. Just being able to hit a button and watch it all go instead of having to manually go through that stuff. And like I said, when you had... progress bars. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. yes. The build the command system is built in Odin, so Odin is building itself in in a way. Actually, it has yeah. very nice UI. Oh, nice. Why not? Right. Turning into Roslyn, right? <laughs> yeah, Odin is self-hosted partially. You guys have uh, big red and green lights in your in your offices and rooms now too for the progress when the build's going. I saw a video <laughs> yesterday of somebody. They said they moved all of their build lights to the home because everybody's working from home. Their whole house is lighting up red and green <laughs> and the bill goes. I can just imagine no, my wife loving that. <laughs> kind of funny. We don't have a build server um, pipeline or like a, um, a CI setup, actually. We tried, oh, okay. We've tried a few times to sort of custom code something like that, but Odin has a lot of custom requirements. And right now it's been easier for us to just hit the build button on our local PC and then go make coffee for yeah. 20 minutes. Oh, OK. And just have that kick off, yeah. Yeah. Just got just to set up another PC that just has a little bird that keeps clicking the button over and over. <laughs> okay, uh, there was a question that you guys already answered earlier, but I think that everybody should get it because it was answered in chat, which was about um, 
Will Odin support UI elements in the future? Yes, that is yes. planned. Yeah. We're working on it. I, uh, I assume will... that was... Go ahead. We will eventually um, switch fully to UI elements is our current plan and intention in that the current MGUI system will be deprecated entirely at some point far in the future. Yeah. But we do intend to, it's basically going to be a full re-implementation of literally every single one of Odin's attributes and UI features and UI elements. Like it has to be rewritten from the bottom up for UI elements. Which is for us like we're ecstatic. It's a very very nice chance. We have some old legacy code and different places, and the collection drawer is a big spaghetti mess. And you know, there's lots of little things that we're like, eh, we could, I could do with a rework. And this is our excuse to to do all of that. And it's I think with new stuff. elements, a nice uh, a nice new patterns, and, and we have some great um, great ideas for how it should be set up. I think we can do a nicer UI in like a quarter of the code. Nice. That'll be a big shrink. I, I yeah, think that would it's, be very nice. This is what going to be your fourth revision. You're on number three. Is is it out now or just about to release? Three will within the next two or three months enter an early pre 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 view alpha stage. Is what I would describe it as. A lot of will the features. Have... A lot of the features are written, and a lot of them aren't. Probably be called beta. Actually. Yeah, yeah, we'll call it beta, but whatever. All right, and that'll be with UI elements. Or no, but uh, it will no, be with no. all the stuff yeah. that the UI elements need. Um, okay. Like we're having a new module system that has these sort of packages of code that can conditionally activate or deactivate and update themselves, like a little mini package manager for Odin, just very, very minimalistic, so that we can do stuff like support UI elements without requiring the user to custom install packages on their own and without uh, removing support for earlier versions of Unity that don't have UI elements. Oh, OK. Just kind of hot swap right. it on the, the newer version? Yeah. Uh, Odin is, I mean, technically, and no, not, not technically, literally, Odin supports right now from Unity 5.3 to Unity 2020.1 alpha preview. Or it's, it's a big range. Now. Well, beats that, right? Yeah. We work in 5.3. That's our dev environment. Oh, wow. Do you plan on continuing to support 5.3 um, with UI elements and everything? I mean, once you go into the builds with UI elements, or do you plan on deprecating the old um, 5 series stuff sometime? We haven't really decided yet. Point, probably, I would imagine, but we would have probably. to have a good reason to to like go up the version of because we would want to jump a few versions. We would want to come to at least 2018 or something. Uh, before it really makes sense, but we definitely still need to support uh, 2017 and maybe even a uh, 5.6 as well. Fair enough. Right. Yeah, yeah, I guess without a reason. It's the balancing, right? Because why do we? We have all these systems for developing in newer versions of Unity and having it still be compatible with older versions, right? And right now we just don't. We haven't had a reason that's compelling enough to actually make a switch. To new uh, versions I, I think that's good. Uh, being able to maintain backwards compatibility and not having anything that's really pushing your hand and forcing you to switch is, I think, a really good thing. Is in you get happy customers that can keep using your stuff and not have to worry about my project. Uh, I can't get the latest version of this because it doesn't work with, anymore with mine. Um, there are a couple other questions. If you guys, you guys, got time for a few more? We'll go through these. Sure. Okay. Um. Let's see. So somebody had asked about whether or not the Odin inspector, I guess the Odin serializer, does anything with the scene serialization. Can you serialize? I think what they're trying to do is serialize a scene reference, it looks like. Uh, oh, a attribute. scene reference. No, yeah, no we, 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 we don't do that. Do that. That's okay. just a feature Unity doesn't really allow. Um, you can hack things together, uh, and uh, you can do something nice inspector stuff with uh, with Odin. Uh, but it's just this weird thing in Unity that this doesn't work for some reason. I don't understand. Huh. I wonder what it is. It's interesting. It's Unity doesn't expose a scene concept that's serializable. Yeah. Uh, you can only do you can an access a scene by name. Uh, as a string or by its index in the build uh, scene build order, right? 
Uh, but uh, the unity doesn't have a concept of a uh, scene in that way, really. There's no it asset does, that you can reference. In the editor, well, you have a scene asset as a thing, uh, but that's only in the editor and you can't do it anywhere mm -hmm. else. Yeah, so unity is just not built for that. It's kind of the same reason Odin's realizer can't write, um, uh, can, can't work with unity object references, except within the context of an actual unity object that where we just extend the serialization. Like Odin's realizer can't write a whole uh, game object to a file and then spit it back out in some other place because well that game object has components that have material references that have textures that have you know unity doesn't expose the ways of referencing those things in a build. Uh, so can't do it. Unity doesn't let you. Sorry. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> it answers their question at least, right? Uh, there was another one that I thought was kind of interesting and probably a lot of people were wondering about too, which was um, what are you guys doing, I guess, to support some of the new stuff that's coming along? Does Odin do anything to work with um, dots or addressables um, or any of these new systems? Have you guys looked at integrating in with those? Is there anything that it even should do with those? Does, does it even make sense? Yes, actually, um, that's that's a big new part of 3.0 is the module system that I mentioned earlier, which your element support is going to be a module, right? And um, uh, and we have an other module for dots ECS support that integrates Odin and Entity Inspector, and um, that that's working. I mean, that's already in. That's in 3.0 right now, um, and we have. Um, I think we have an addressable. So let me just look. Uh, we have a bunch of modules. They're pretty easy to set up. Make sure we have a nice workflow. We are a workflow company, so yes, we like, to, uh, uh, we like to cuddle. We like to not not cuddle. What's it called? Like uh, uh, we like to make things nice for ourselves. We have an addressables package. We have a Unity Mathematics uh, module as well that adds support for all of the Unity Mathematics uh, types. Oh. and um, and I think that's it right now. So, but but anytime there's a new like the module system is a new sort of go-to tool uh, for adding package support because these are things that aren't even version dependent on Unity, right? It's it's very it's dependent on a thing that itself changes within versions of Unity, which is a package. Is that package there or not? It's not even a compile time condition. You can't do like an an if uh, around some scripts or something. You have to uh you have to have some code that detects whether the package is there or not and if it's the right version and then it has to spit out the files in a compilable form such that unity actually finds them yeah so that's what the module system does it's it's our new uh yeah it oh, seems sorry, like a good, good idea it's a good system i mean it's it's kind of like what you it's it, it really literally matches up with what unity is doing right it's just a your own version of a package manager which is what i think the entire industry is generally doing unity is just kind of a little bit behind a lot of the other tech um mm. but now they're all caught up too so I, I think it's a good idea to be able to support that and plug stuff in and then it's nice that you're going to support some of the new stuff um the question that was right after that though was about licensing and this is probably a, a one that a lot of people have and don't even think about but is the license per person per project um per c like how does how does that generally work? I've always thought of it as a per developer license, but I didn't really think about digging into it and checking. Is, is it is that the case? Is it you just need one per like program? It's one per seat. Okay. It's one per seat. Uh, it's it's the Unity's default per seat license for okay. editor extensions. And then and that's a big complicated license that you can go read up on. But the basic is one per person uh, working on the project in Unity. So yeah, and that clarifies. So it's essentially like any artist or designer or whatever opening the project in Unity should have a, a license for it, right? So you should basically have one per person on your team that's working in the project. Yes, Just like you do for much, Unity, yeah. right? It's essentially the same as Unity per, per person restriction, yeah. right? Yeah. No, I mean, think, of it, think of it the same no, way. Because it, it can be confusing because yeah. art, art ones are generally like one per project, right? So it's um, it yeah, can get a little confusing for people. So I that, understand. that makes sense that they would be right because yeah. that's the thing that you have. Yeah. This is a tool that people use, right? And it scales with the more people you are in the project, the more use you get out of Odin because everybody is getting the new nice inspectors and workflows and blah blah blah. So it does make sense because it does scale in usefulness and utility with a number of people. 
more right. people you have in your project, the more Odin makes everything nicer and faster for you. I totally agree. And I think of it, like I said, a lot like just Unity, but with a one-time cost instead of a monthly cost. Right? Like it's, it is that tool or part of your workflow. It's just like any other tool that you'd buy. It just, I think sometimes people get mixed up because it's an in editor tool. It can be confusing because you pull it in and there's nothing really forcing you saying, hey, like your license isn't updated enough. Yeah, no, we don't yeah. do uh, um, DRM. Right. And I think that would be like a, a Unity thing to implement if they wanted to do that. Like they'd start yeah. linking assets to accounts um, so that it was all just the same for everyone. Um, we thought about it a few times, but we don't like DRM on principle. We're more with CD Projekt Red on that one. It seems like it'd be too much work, um, too much, it, it, a lot of overhead for very little benefit, right? Exactly. Generally, yeah. programmers that want to hack mostly, around DRM are going to do it. <laughs> yeah, it just gets in the way of the people who legitimately want to use it. So I don't know, we're exactly. not in for DRM. Um, I mean, the pirates also legitimately want to use it, right? But, you know. It's <laughs> uh, true. Yeah, but they're going to get around the DRM no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've learned time. to stop fighting pirates because they're, they're just going to fight back and waste all your time. Uh, just yeah. got to fight the cheaters in your online games. That's, that's much harder. <laughs> um, so uh, what, what's the future of serialization for Odin? Somebody's asking about this. Like, what's the, uh, and I, it seems like kind of a big, vague, wide open question, but is there like, aside, I guess you've kind of talked a little bit about it, but like uh, big the, goals for Odin, is it mostly just the, the new stuff with UI elements and the package manager stuff, or is there some other cool Odin serialization thing that you're really excited about in the future? Odin is so much more of a... Odin or Odin inspector? Odin serialization, they asked, right? I think um, right. Yeah. Odin is much more of an inspector and, and custom workflow and tooling generator than it is a, a serializer, really. Uh, serialization is, is a very nice feature, but it's, uh, if, if Unity tomorrow were to say, okay, now our serializer can do all the same things that Odin serializer can do, we would be like, awesome, great, we love that. Now we don't have to worry about that part anymore because we consider it a crucial part of the workflow to have that ability. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's like, it would be nicer if it was part of Unity, right? Right. Uh, and so do you consider Unity it mostly going done? in that direction. It's a tricky question. Um, hey, b barring new changes in Unity and new things to come, um, would you consider it mostly feature complete then? There's not any anything uh, a bar and i know like nested prefabs would be a nice one but um yeah uh, oh. I, I mean since odin released the serializer has really been feature complete we've okay. practically only made optimizations and bug fixes for it i mean fundamentally serialization a lot of people use it as this big buzzword or some big super complicated thing but serialization is fundamentally an extremely simple thing an extremely simple action you take uh, an object graph in memory you, store it down in some sort of format, you serialize it, you know, put it in order, and then you read it back out, recreate the object graph. And that's fundamentally not that complicated. It's it's a pretty simple thing, really. So Yeah, I think as a core yeah. concept, it's it's relatively easy. It's all the work that you guys have done to make it um work with all of these different data types and work with inside Unity that um I think is is where the hard stuff comes, right? Like the the big work that yes. you've done. Which is nice. Um, oh, and for the serialization, um, I, I just kind of curious. Do you guys prefer binary or text serialization? Uh, this was always a big thing for me back in the old days before everything was just kind of defaulted to forced text. Um, I'm just I'm curious. Gonna what uh, I'm going to answer your question with a question. For what purpose? Um, just for, I mean, for your Unity settings in general, for serializing out your prefabs and... Uh, I'm just curious if there's any reason that you would not use text serialization now, or do you always use text serialization? For anything where it makes sense for it to be human readable, source controlled, I absolutely prefer text. Yeah. Um, I'm the same I way. Mean, yeah, and it's like, because you can go, you can look at the data, you can see this thing changed and this thing changed, and you can have one line per data, if it's just a binary blob. Then uh, you know it's, if you change one bool in your 
20 kilobyte object and the whole blob changed and that's one new line in the yeah. commit right and that's insane uh but for some things like obviously you don't want like a texture text right. no no right? uh, so uh, it's situational but I, i'd say text for storing uh, data and, and configurations uh, and, and for source controlled uh, you know things like game objects and component scenes assets script object you know makes perfect sense for it to be text and it should be uh, for things that are extremely performance intensive uh, and at runtime, obviously binary is, is the answer. Okay, that, that's kind of that's where I am. I'd say with things too. I just kind of wanted to get the um, professional take on it too, and make sure that it matched for everybody else. I'd consider you the serialization experts, so <laughs> make sure that uh, yeah, everybody is on the same page. Also, um, Brian sent me something. Brian sent me a discount for everybody to get half off Odin. So if you're interested in grabbing it, you can just go to devdog.io and use the uh, code odinspector.com. Odinspector.com. Odin, Odin oh, oh, odinspector.com. Ignore me. So go to odinspector.com and use the code odin-jason. I'm going to just drop it into um, the description. Um, so everybody can go check it out. Brian just sent this. And the thing it should last for 30 days. It so, should last till the end of next month. All right, there you go. That's like almost 40 days. So go get out in. Okay. I'll, if you I'm would like to try it out. Putting both of these into the uh, into the description right now. So everybody, if you're interested, go check it out. I would check it out. I use it. I love it. Um, I don't know. Why I love it too. Wouldn't. Yeah. It's just a cool tool. I mean, anything that I feel like anything that makes my job easier and my life easier um, is something that I want to grab. And uh, grabbing good tools is huge. Um, Odin and Ryder, like two, like just things I grab without even thinking about as a game developer. Yeah. Um, here. I haven't actually tried Ryder yet, really. Not much. I really should at some point. Oh, yeah, you Still definitely a should. Visual Studio guy. Huh? All I've heard is people complaining about Ryder. So. Oh really? I, everybody I know that's used it and forced themselves to well, use this it is has not switched back. People not using Rider that's been complaining about Rider, basically. Oh oh. The thing is, I hated Resharper so much. Oh, oh it's yeah, Resharper. It Sorry, I'm I I I I'm I'm mixing them up. That's why. Oh yeah, Resharper kind of. I liked it when I used C plus um, plus back in the old days of like what was it, two thousand five. Um, I didn't like it recently, but when I switched to Rider, I intentionally forced myself to use it for a month. I said, all right, I'm just going to use this for a month. I'm going to remove Visual Studio just to see if I actually like it. Because I knew that it would be too easy to just default back to the crutch of um, using Visual Studio. So when, when I made the I'm... switch and forced myself, it instantly, it, I'd say within a week, I was, I was hooked. I remember distinctly with ReSharper the moment I uninstalled it and decided I would never even think about doing anything with it again forever was when I had a very nice, very fast optimized for loop. And then it suggested a refactor to make it into a link statement. And I was like, nope, <laughs> nope, I am out of here. That's funny. I, well, that, that was that. when Link came out, yeah. Yeah, it was, right. uh, it was bad. Link now what is, it does, the, though. The past four months of Odin work for me in terms of optimization has been removing Link anywhere I find oh, it. Yeah, that, that tends to happen. I, I usually write my Link statements, and then I optimize them out before I commit. It's my general rule. Like, I'll write them as I'm like trying to figure out what the logic is, and then I will refactor it out once I've figured out and I'm solid on what I want to do, and then I'll kill any Link statement. <laughs> Yeah. I do love yeah. Link though. It's yeah. such a nice thing to just write and read. And it is. It is very nice. Yeah, what do yeah, you mean, yeah. Link? You like, or how are you pronounce it? I don't know. Isn't it Link? Just... I think no, so. Yeah. I usually Link. say Link. You. Uh, I don't know. Language integrated query. <laughs> <laughs> that is the one. Yeah. Let me see. I think I had something else I was going to ask you guys real quick, but now I've totally forgotten what it was. It was not link related. I don't even remember. Well, we were talking about Rider before. Something to do with that, maybe? 
I don't know. Other than I would recommend you go try it out. Oh, what I was going to say about Rider was that now it um, when you're in Unity, it's really Unity aware, and it generally gives a lot of good Unity context specific tips. So it'll tell you, hey, don't do this because it has a very specific problem in you. Things like um, the the easiest and most obvious one is uh, no coalescing a game object that could be destroyed. Right? It'll literally pop up and warn you and it give you a link to an article on why that's bad. But it'll tell you um, all kinds of different tips and the refactors that it recommends tend to be better in Unity from what I've seen lately than at least than the code that I usually write. It usually recommends things Very that nice. are a, a slight improvement or um, it gives little, it just gives lots of little tips in there to make the code better. Um, it always recommends converting things to expression body properties and methods when it makes sense. Um, a lot of little things to just clean stuff up and it's easy to run unit tests in there. Really oh, I'm seeing a guy saying here, one of the best things I like about writer is how it compiles the code as you write. I always hated switching to editor and waiting for a few, uh, a few seconds for it to compile. Like, versions of Unity just do that because it feels like it does that in Visual Studio as well. That sounds awesome. Uh, I don't know, maybe modern Unity versions just do that. Uh, in 5.3, in which we work, it obviously doesn't. Right. Uh, but most of our code is not in the actual project anyways. It's in a Visual Studio solution that we just compile into the project. We have a lot of weird custom built stuff. It's a really funky setup actually, but it works very nicely for us. Oh, that's interesting. Um, do you want to just talk about that for a minute? Because I've had this discussion with a lot of people, and I think that your scenario is one of the few where it makes a lot of sense to have that externally built project. Um, I have some friends who build all of their things in external, or as much of their stuff in external DLLs and then pull it in as possible. Sometimes I think it's overkill. I think in the Odin scenario, it probably makes perfect sense because it's an editor extension like that. So. You do the majority of the code you're saying is just in external DLLs and then pulled into a Unity project? Yeah. 98% of it, at least. Probably more like 99% uh, oh, wow. of, of it is, uh, is in assemblies. We have um, one, two, three, four, five, six assemblies um, that Odin is split up into. Oh, OK. And do those and then, reference Unity Engine? Or I assume no, right? Those uh, yes, they, they, do. they do. Oh. Oh, I think okay. they, they all do. They all do. They all do, yeah. That's definitely possible. Uh, yeah, no, they all do. They all reference Unity Engine and, and Unity Editor, except, um, well, it's complicated. We have custom build scripts that do a lot of stuff. I mean, when we build a DLL, we don't just build the DLL. We built a DLL, and then um, uh, we make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's we, we compile Odin with Roslyn. So we don't use like any uh, the Unity's compiler or anything, right? We compile it with Roslyn, uh, with a nice modern C# compiler, and then that generates Microsoft symbol files like the MSD or MSB, what is it? Uh, uh, files, and then we have to convert them into, uh, um, or is it the PDB? And then we use a utility from that we go and find in our Unity installation to convert those into the Mono symbol files and. You know, we do all kinds of weird things with it. Uh, it sounds complicated. Billion variants with it, uh, like with these uh, pre uh, like uh, preprocessor directives active, and with these, you know. So we have a big build system. It sounds like it, uh, and this is taking a long time to build up, like you'd mentioned. So it's. <laughs> um, actually, I'm sure that part, uh, that part is like really old. That was done in. I think Bjarke, who's sadly no longer with us now, uh, he built the build system way back before we launched. And we had a hell of a time. I think we spent a week doing it, just trying to figure out what the setup was going to be. And there were real rules for like, Unity will find this assembly and use it properly and let it have Unity object types in it, but only if it's in this folder and it won't find this other thing if it's in a child folder, but it will if it, the child folder is called this or something. And I don't, I don't remember all the crazy rules. We were just, we just it was a shotgun approach. <laughs> we're just trying, well, what if we put this down there and this up here? And what if we switch those two around? And then eventually we just hit upon the configuration that works and it's just worked ever since. And we just, we don't touch yeah, it. Luckily. Like, go, don't touch it. It's funny how often that happens too. Like setting these things up. <laughs> um, there, there were two other questions I wanted to ask you guys before I let you go. I, I don't want to eat up your whole night, but um, 
There were two that popped up in chat that I thought were kind of interesting. Oh, one the guys asked a couple times, Andy asked in the chat, was about uh, node graph stuff. Do you guys have any node graph stuff or plans for Odin? Not really, no. Uh, yeah, there was once. once there were, yeah, there was once where someone made a, uh, a GitHub project that implemented node graphs with units, uh, with Odin. Uh, but I'm pretty oh, sure. Oh, Sleipnir, I think. Left. Yeah, uh, that's been abandoned. Uh, that's been abandoned yeah. uh, now. But I know that there is a very nice user called Kajet, K A J E D, on Discord, who has made an Odin integration for Xnode, which is an open source framework, um, like a node graph framework. Uh, so if you use Xnode, uh, I know that the base master branch of Xnode has a decent Odin integration right now, out of the box. It just checks if Odin is there, and then it triggers the Odin code, and um, and I think he has a pull request that still needs a bit of work that does a better Odin integration as well. And then you can try that out and give him some feedback on that or help him out with it. So if you want Odin, then uh, I haven't tried it myself. If it's laggy, somebody's saying it's laggy. I don't know. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't tried it either, but um, it does seem somewhat out of the purview of, of Odin, but uh, be interesting to see. No graph stuff. So expect fun. this, so. Yeah. Yes, no, maybe. I don't it, know. At least somewhat Generally related. Odin kind of... Might be pretty, uh, it, it might actually be pretty close to, it's a very easy to do with Odin because Odin is about inspecting data. Data as a structure is a graph. It can have cyclic references and blah, 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 right? Um, and in that sense, a lot of Odin's power and flexibility is about understanding graphs and working with graphs. And the whole property system has been built for that exact purpose. So, I mean, it's really just a tiny little extra UI addition on top of the whole graph comprehension stuff we've got. And then you've got it. So you're saying you're going to nice. put it in this weekend? Right. I actually, <laughs> actually, actually, yes. I, actually back, uh, I think it was a few months ago, I sat down and I tried to do a simple note thing in Odin. And I got something pretty simple working in like two hours. Oh, nice. And I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like super awesome or anything, but it was the basics of it all. It had it had you know different nodes and connections, and you could specify where it would break between, like what counted as a different node versus just the thing that was part of the actual um, you know what was part of a node and what was broken out into a new node with a mm. line between them and so on. It was it was nice, but there were issues with it and the order of rendering and stuff like that. I think with UI elements, it would be a lot easier. Probably. I've seen some Maybe. interesting stuff Maybe with like UI elements. Go ahead. Uh, maybe later. I was oh, okay. maybe, yeah. It, it does seem oh. like UI elements would make a lot of these issues we had when we made Odin would just make that a lot easier. Oh. Uh, at least I'm hoping. But you know. And then the, the last question I wanted to bring up was one that uh, Jeff asked, but I, I'll trim it down a little bit. He said he'd been using it for a long time, but wasn't sure he's getting the full value out of Odin and uh, wanted to list the top five features to focus on. Is there even like a top one or two for each of you that you would recommend people like spend a little bit of time learning about where you think they'll get a lot of value is if it's um, editor windows or some certain set of attributes or a thing that you think... Um, is something you find a lot of people get value out of that they just don't think to look at initially? Well, as I mentioned before, the required attribute is definitely good, but I think most people using Odin already use that, to be perfectly honest. I would answer the question on more like meta perspective, right? Because everybody who uses it just a tiny bit knows of the, the basic attributes. And they can find it with the attribute overview. Okay. Uh, the most useful thing you can do with Odin. First is you can sort of get used to the attribute module, the modular attribute composition mindset, right? Where you combine different attributes and you use the groups and so on. Uh, and just become fluent in the attributes. That would be my, my top one uh, suggestion. And uh, and, you know, just go through the features, basically. That's that's like become fluent in the, in the basic features that don't require you to program much or understand much about programming to use. Uh, but if you really want to get go like crazy and want to do insane custom things with Odin and we can get insane use out of it, that requires you to go in and learn 
how the system works because Odin is mind-bogglingly extendable these days. It's really, really, you can make it do anything. Uh, and that requires that you understand how the property system works. You can tell the property system how to understand new things. You can make your own custom drawers, your own custom attributes. Uh, you can do things with attribute processors and property processors. And I know I'm just throwing out all these terms here. We have videos about all of this now. So you can go to our DevDog uh, YouTube channel and you can check out all of the videos that, uh, that we've been putting out and they're great. Uh, made by Jeremy from One World Studio. Yeah, those videos and, um, are good stuff. Everybody should. I I definitely recommend go check those out. Yeah, I'll so link the dev the videos with, We started the videos with covering the basics, and then um, we just have been starting to go and in, get into more advanced stuff like attribute processors and property processors and so on. Right now, we're doing a series on custom drawers, and we're always work closely with Jeremy and and uh, in the writing the uh, scripts for the videos and how, how it all works out. So um, the, the videos are great. You should all go check them out if you don't, uh, if you haven't seen them yet. Yeah, and I'll, I'll make sure to link those in just a minute too in the uh, the description if anybody's watching. Um, and also, anybody watching, don't forget there's a discount for Odin. If you want to go check it out, go grab it. I would grab it while it's on sale. Um, good deal, half off. And then I wanted to just... Briefly, I guess before we wrap up, see if there was anything else you guys wanted to talk about or um, share with everybody. If you guys have any. Look forward to 3.0, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> we'll have lots of awesome things. The module system is the least of it. There are really going to be some nice usability upgrades. Uh, and, uh, the discount is on odininspector.com with the code uh, odinjson, odin json. That's down in the uh, description as well. You should be yes. able to grab it. Sorry, I see it in chat too. Thanks. Cool. And when is when do you expect three point to release? Um, it should. We should put it into uh, a beta uh, for anybody who's got Odin uh, on our website. Um, so, and that will happen. I always hate giving timelines. You know, you know how it is. Sometime uh, this year, yeah, wait. <laughs> Definitely, absolutely, sometime this year. I okay. would guess within. Uh, we should have a, a, an, an alpha with most of the features ready for testing and and breaking, because I know everybody's going to break everything. Um, within about two months, would be my guess. Okay, a couple months from now. Sounds exciting. Yeah. And for yeah, now, I mean, now. you can still use Odin and all of the stuff that it does. This is just for the new things and the latest version that's not even really out and used yet, right? Yeah, and meanwhile, yeah. we're still putting out, you know, my, minor patches with uh, f fixes and optimizations and uh, sl slight new, small new features. And yeah. um, I mean, we just recently added uh, this inspection support for Unity's new serialized reference attribute. So if you want to have polymorphism and, and do all the Odin serialization stuff in Unity without Odin serialization, well, you can use Unity's new serialized reference attribute. Yeah. And when you get issues with it in prefabs, because it does not work with prefabs, they haven't figured that part out either. Then you can go complain to Unity instead of us. <laughs> and that's one I actually haven't used yet, is the serialized reference. It just, just came out, and I haven't actually um, run into a scenario where it was going to help me yet. I'm waiting for that to happen. Oh, I'm waiting to upgrade my mm -hmm. big project so that I actually have more scenarios <laughs> where things can actually happen. <laughs> A simple use case already would just be something like an interface where you might assign something like uh, scriptable objects. Um, you don't really need an interface for that, but maybe you want to, and maybe it should be a component instead. And I, I think it will work well with that. I don't know if it supports Unity object references yet, actually. I haven't tested that. I'm not sure it does. So I believe will... I saw that that was a limitation right now, that you cannot assign a Unity oh, okay. object reference to an interface, which is Kind of embarrassing to be honest. Yes. Uh, uh, but I but I have not confirmed that, so don't take my word for it. I think I, you're I, correct. I, I think that was what I tried to do the when I first saw it and realized I couldn't, and then got a little confused. Well, that's my big on, use case. Example. So. Hmm. Yep, it doesn't support Unity objects. Is what people are saying in chat. Okay. Huh. A shame. I, well, it, it 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 probably will. I, I hope. They should yes. add that. They should definitely add that. That would be a huge uh, missing point. I, yeah, that that was what I was hoping it was going to give me. 
Yeah, I didn't even think that would be a missing feature. Okay, sure. Oh. Well, I've got um, nothing else. If you guys are, don't have anything else you wanted to add, I guess we can wrap this up and then maybe do this again sometime. It's a lot of fun. I, I'd like to do a talk and just go through some of the, the technical stuff sometime, maybe explain um, you know, some of the interesting problems that you got to go through and solve with uh, the serialization and the... The, the editor overriding maybe maybe some stuff after you release three we could talk a little bit about what that process was like and what that conversion was like going through it the, a second time or you know i guess a third or fourth time really <laughs> right of rewriting this code and, and rewriting the system seeing what that process was like how you liked it but i i really appreciate having you guys on it was a lot of fun um and hopefully everybody goes to grab odin because it's definitely worth getting yeah it's been fun and i would love to do another stream at some point sure that sounds sounds like a lot of fun all right. Well, I wanted to say, yeah, thanks again, both you guys. And um, thanks, everybody, for joining us and asking questions. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and go grab Odin. And um, uh, I think that's it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Yeah. Cheers. Bye.